Hi, everybody. Uh, today, we are in this panel session, we are going to talk about improving open source management and readiness in the energy sector. And we are welcoming uh, OSPO directors and are going to share lessons from the past years. My name is Anne Tilloy. I'm working at RT as community manager of a possible project, one of the oldest projects of the foundation. Uh, I'm a software developer too in Power Systems. And uh, Possible Indeed is a pioneering project of RTE where we have tried to implement the best practices and concepts advocated by the foundation and by RTE's uh, OSPO. So I welcome today Boris Dolé, who is uh, the OSPO and uh, Sustainable IT Director at RTE. I welcome uh, Jonas von den Bogart, who is open source lead uh, for Allender OSPO, right? And uh, Sebastian Gruner, who is uh, OSPO lead for Eon Digital Technology. Boris, I always say that open source is about people. That's right. Uh, can you tell more about you? Oh, yes, about me. Um, is it okay for the microphone? Is it working for you? Okay, perfect. So uh, about me, I am a computer scientist and I work in RT since uh, I was a student, so 1997. And uh, I'm now leading, uh, as um, uh, Anne mentioned, the Bureau of Open Source, we call the OSPO, of course. And uh, I think that open source is more a commitment. It's a journey and it's more a personal journey for me than a professional one because uh, we saw in the first panel session that the question is decarbonization, electrification has a great role to play and open source has a great role to play to build it together. So that's my, that's my Thank you very singularity. Thank <laughs> uh, Jonas, quite the same question, why are you in that position yeah. and uh, tell me more about you. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, for me, at the energy transition and to moving more to a sustainable world really drives me in personally. Yeah? So uh, I, mean it's, I really enjoy being part of that journey and helping, especially Aliander uh, as a distribution system operator in the Netherlands, uh, to achieve that. In particular, early also uh, use digitalization as one of the enablers uh, to achieve that. And as also mentioned in the, the panel before, I see uh, open source and particular collaborations uh, through uh, partnerships is, is key in, in scaling this digitalization ambition we have at Aliander, but also spending the money, uh, time and resources we have more efficiently and take benefit of uh, all those uh, experts, knowledge, and link out there uh, to, to, to drive this innovation. And uh, particularly, really happy that I am uh, now able to take the leading role in Aliena's open source program office uh, to drive particular open source collaborations uh, throughout Aliena and uh, also here today uh, as well. Thank you. Sebastian, you have a quite original uh, professional uh, <coughs> tr uh, travel. Can you tell me about more about you? So I've used to work as an IT journalist. So I did write about open source software for more than 13 years. Um, and like what drove me into open source and software development was like that purpose involved with it. Like it's not just developing software, there's community around it, it gives the people purpose, they can be seen and be out there and basically collaborate in between companies and on certain topi topics. And I really liked that, and I really liked uh, writing about this. But eventually, something in me said that I'm still missing out on well, actively participating in open source. And so I started to look for jobs that I could contribute to open source with my knowledge. And I don't really like programming, so I didn't end up <laughs> in the career that all you three did. Um, and so I ended up in a kind of technical program manager position within the OSPO. And I'd, there at Eon, I could combine the same thing that drove me to open source with 
like the purpose of like decarbonization, industry transformation. Um, and Eon is a purpose-driven company, so it's kind of a good match for me to be now at Eon for the open source. Thank you. Um, OSPO, uh, it's uh, the shortcut of open source program office. I have taken the definition from the to-do group, and um, I have uh, used uh, artificial intelligence to draw a word cloud. Um, can you, each of you, can you uh, pick up two words, the more relevant words you want the audience to remember from our panel session? Sebastian? Um, I really like the responsible and responsibility because like, open source is not just developing software. There's a lot of responsibility involved with it. Um, and I guess all of us here are aware of this responsibility, like license compliance and community work. And like this whole conference started with Alex pointing to the code of conduct. So we, we take care of a lot of things that are not just software. And I really like this about open source, this responsibility for each other and for other people. Um, and then yeah, the contributing stuff. That's why we're all here. Like yeah. We want to contribute to the better, um, to be better, to contribute um, for, yeah, for all of us, basically. Thank you. Jonas? I wanted to pick uh, contributing too, but you were uh, <laughs> ahead of me. <laughs> so I'll pick another one. So uh, I will take the supporting one. Yeah, so one, uh, I think uh, uh, me, Boris, and, uh, and Sebastian play a key role in, in organizations like ours to help also the organization uh, to use open source, be compliant, uh, but also make the organization able to contribute to open source and uh, remove any barriers uh, and create also trust at different levels to make that possible. Thank you. Boys? My turn? Yes. I'll get um, early and fast. <laughs> Small words in it, but uh, two important words. Because we are here uh, in this panel session trying to give uh, information about the readiness level for you or your company or whatever uh, to, to build a OSPO. But before building an OSPO, you have to begin your upstream journey, which means you have to involve in open source. And to involve in open source, it's easy to do it early, very fast. You just have to move forward. You just have to decide to do it. And the same for the OSPO. We will go further on later on, but it's easy to go early and to go fast to build what you want to build through open source, in open source. So trust in yourself and don't be shy. Don't wait to have a perfect work in order to publish it. Do it. Thank you. Just uh, do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Sebastian, why invest in open source management and readiness? Well, my, well, before I started at Eon, my <coughs> boss basically had to make a point on why we need that OSPO position. And at that point, he came up with a thing that we now tell everyone within the company, that our estimation is something between 95 and 100% of the software that we use somewhere involves open source software. Like you, you, literally can't get around open source anymore. And be it like a compiler in your stack is open source, or even all your dependencies that you use in a software development uh, context may be open source. So there's just no way around it. Um, and once companies are aware of this, they need to change something. And you need to take um, like a more strategic approach to this open source thing. And this is something that companies in a well slow moving industry like energy don't necessarily understand if the management is deconnected from the software development. Um, so this this needs to change. And the people, especially higher up, need to be aware of this open source thing because it's literally everywhere. Um, and you can make good use of it. So it's really important to invest in it. Thank you. Uh, Jonas, why form a NOSPO, because you can do open source without creating a NOSPO. Yeah. I think I want to add on what Sebastian was telling. Eh? Open source is out there in, in pretty much each of our organizations. And um, 
it's a risk uh, to not consider open source management uh, as an organization. And OSPOS is a great way to give organization about how to fill that in. Yeah? And there's multiple ways you can organize your OSPO. You can, hey, some, in some organizations, it's, it's a really dedicated team uh, that can be hosted in the digitalization department or IT department or at the ID department. In other organizations, more virtual organized or more informal. But I think in, in, in essence, it, it, it's really important that you bring together uh, the open source knowledge you already have in your organization uh, together to form uh, best practices, but also open source policies around the usage of open source, but also about contributing to open source, but also the legal ex expertise around open source, and make that expertise, uh, best practice, and policy available for the wider organization to use and reuse. Yeah, so you are talking about uh, OSPO organization. What, indeed, what is your team? How many people do you have? And what is your organization? What is the strategy of Allende, yeah. OSPO? Yeah. And I think it's good to mention that there's not, not one golden way of how to organize an, an OSPO. So, but at Allende, our OSPO, I would say, con consists about seven people. But it's good to mention that none of the seven people which are involved in OSPO do it, f do it full time. Eh? They all uh, have uh, different roles beside it. Eh? If you look at our OSPO capacity in terms of full time uh, FTEs, it's more around two. And so we have a lot of people involved with from different expertise. And that really helps us uh, to, to really address the broad spectrum of what open source accomplish. Eh? It's, it's about, sometimes it's about procurement, sometimes it's about uh, legal questions, sometimes it's about communication questions, sometimes it's about training, uh, but sometimes it's also more IT or, or, or related questions. And I think what's uh, has been really successful in our OSPO is to have these different competences available in, in our OSPO team. Uh, uh, sa same question for Sebastian. Can you present your OSPO, the team, uh, the organization? <laughs> well, the team is basically me. So <laughs> I started in April at E.ON. Um, but like the reason because I started is that like the company um, finally came to the conclusion that we need some kind of strategic, strategic involvement, someone who actually takes care of this and not just small-time people doing part-time things. Um, so they came up with a full-time position, which is now filled by me. Um, but I tried to set up my OSPO work in the same way like uh, yes, uh, Jonas just described. Like, I talk to the legal department, I talk to the procurement people, I talk to the people that um, do our patent stuff, and then I talk to well, the open source leads within the different companies of E.ON um, and try to set up some kind of well, cluster of people that try to work within the strategy that I come up with and try to involve basically everyone, because um, I can't handle that alone. Um, but yeah, I'm basically full-time and all the others do it part-time. <laughs> yeah, and same question for you, Boris. Maybe there is a, a big difference between uh, the two other directors. Can you tell me more about this? Yes, there's a difference because uh, in RT, the open source program office is located in the R&D department. And m in, in uh, many companies, uh, the open source program office is located in the ICT department. Um, and this difference, we can explain it at RT because uh, the open source journey began in the R&D department because this is where the uh, digital assets were published first. Now we are speaking, we have critical open source projects in production. You are leading yeah. one. So um, w we are ready to jump in to go to the ICT, but the heartbeat of open source in our company and the support from the executive level, and I think it's a common part of our panel session, we all have a support and a, a complete understanding by, what, by our executive level, or a few people in the executive level in our company that was uh, addressed in the panel session uh, for the energy transition and the digitalization, the open source way is, is a path. So we have this common point, but we are in the R&D at RT, and we will stay at the R&D until we have a mature um, 
intermediate layer of managers who are ready for the open source. And this is a part of the job of the OSPO to convince uh, this middle management uh, because salary project manager uh, are already ready for open source and some executive people are. But in the middle management, there is a lot of people who are very, very used, uh, sorry, have the habits of vendor and, and contract management and open source is another way. Yeah, and that was one thing I would uh, like to add. Eh? I think it's important that you, to recognize that you also don't need a big team yeah. uh, to start your open source journey. One FT is yeah. already or an good. OSPO. Yeah. Uh, an OSPO eh? I think it's really about having uh, some people, at, at least one or two, which can take the leadership uh, and ownership around open source and uh, like Boris is doing at RGE and uh, Sebastian is doing at E.ON to take really leadership to bring the people uh, together and, and drive uh, the open source maturity in the organization. Thank you. Um, can we, uh, each of you, give, give us three achievements uh, of your office? Cool start. I will? Yeah. Yes. Start. Three achievements. It's three, b best three, you can two or one. No, 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 three. Uh, we are very proud because in RT we built the LF Energy project. So we were with Aliander uh, and the Linux Foundation, one of the three pioneers in 2017, 18, to think about that. So this is the first achievement, of okay. course. Another That's achievement it. is we've built the OSPO. We're pretty proud of that. And the third one is a huge one because we put it in production, the most critical piece of software for our operator in the control room, uh, calculation, uh, uh, coordination, etc. There is a lot of critical function that came from the open source to production. So this is the main achievement we can speak about. Thank you. You want to ask the same yeah. question? So uh, it's always hard to pick free, but if I've I'm uh, really proud of uh, our achievements. So one is uh, that we were able to, uh, to, in the last few years, to define open source policies and best practice for the use of open source and contributing to open source. Secondly, I'm really proud that we see that the uh, contribution we are doing from Aliando to open source projects is growing. Uh, and I'm really happy that we were also able to um, open source multiple internal projects to open source and build op successful open source communities around those projects. Uh, and see that those projects are not only important, help us innovate at Aliander and to drive innovation, but also help to drive others, uh, peer organization in the sector as well. Um, since I said I started just in April, um, <laughs> it's really hard to come up you, with. You can do three yeah, or one. No, like <laughs> a big achievement for Eon uh, that I Ma uh, made possible was to become part of the Linux Foundation and the CNCF. We may eventually become a member of the LF Energy, um, but that's like in the future. But that was a big achievement because, like, before I started, basically no one at Eon even thought about being part of that associations and thinking about open source. So it's a huge step for Eon to put itself out in an open source and unknown terrain um, and trusting me in this. Uh, to do this. That's a huge achievement. And like the other achievement internally is that I'm seen there. Like it was really impressive for me to, to see that once I started, uh, I talked to people and then there was like a huge mouth to mouth propaganda in a huge company like E.ON. And like now I get calls by people asking me for help that I've never met before. And in a, in a company that I, like the, a subsidiary of E.ON, that I may not even know existed before they contacted me. And they're like, okay, yeah, finally someone is here uh, can, that can answer my questions. Please help us. And it's a huge achievement for me in just yeah, six months being there. Um, although I, c I can't formally answer their questions because we don't have a policy yet and stuff like this, but I can still consult on, on their problems and they have and still try to coordinate between all those companies, and it's a huge achievement because no one did this before. Uh, Jonas, what are the current challenges uh, or priorities uh, Aliander is facing? Aliander OSPO, of yeah. course. Now one priority, I think, in, uh, being in a distribution system operator and 
uh, this machine grid being vital infrastructure, cybersecurity is, is, is of course a top priority for us as an organization, but also for us as OSPO. And so, uh, at the end, we believe that open source is, is can be uh, as secure as uh, non-open source software, or even more secure uh, than non-open source software. But mm, security come not guaranteed. Eh? It needs attention, it needs work. So for us, it's, uh, we were working very closely with our uh, security teams, CISO office, uh, and other teams to build on uh, one side policy, security policies around open source usage, uh, but also providing the tools uh, and the mechanisms in place for the teams to, to allow them uh, to take full benefit of open source, but also in a way uh, that ensures uh, security uh, and its safety. So that's one key priority. Another key priority for us is uh, uh, of course, to drive uh, innovation uh, and seek uh, new op open source collaborations and opportunities. And so we actively are working on identifying uh, with PR organizations, with other organizations, uh, where we can work together on new open source initiatives. And also scaling out, uh, third, uh, third priority is to scaling out our existing open source collaboration. Uh, so how can we make them more successful uh, and scale uh, even further. Thank you. Boris, what are the challenges your, your OSPO is facing today? Um, I think one of the main challenges uh, we are facing at RT for the open source is to go at scale. Um, we have many projects, uh, and I said that they are critical in production, and, and we have many research uh, work uh, we are working on through open source. And what I mentioned, to convince the middle management from the ICT department and, and sometimes from the business units to adopt uh, open source uh, is the main challenge for us to go at scale to, of course, we have this Linux Foundation project, we have this OSPO, and we have very, very uh, nice project with a lot of talent in it. Uh, so. It's 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 already an achievement. But if, if we want if we want sorry to uh, generalize more open source where it makes sense, we have to use uh, many keys, and we didn't find at the time we are speaking the keys to uh, activate this scaling of open source. So this is the main challenge for for, for me and for us as uh, open source stewards. All all of the guys here from RT. Uh, who's working in open source are support for the OSPO and convincing this middle management. So it's a, a, common, a common topic we have. Thank you. Uh, Sebastian, do you well, have a, a challenge? Well, the biggest <laughs> challenge is basically the company itself. Because um, E.ON is not a single company. It's like more like 350 to 500 companies, depending on if, what you count as a subsidiary of E.ON. Um, in Germany alone, we've got like 10 DSOs, three or four energy providers, um, other sales departments that sell home automation. Uh, then we've got the electric car charging stuff. Um, and that's just the big ones. We also have an ISP. Um, we have grid operations in Romania. <laughs> and we, they, it's, like, it's really, really huge, and it's really hard to to even get an understanding of what E.ON does and where E.ON does what, with what kind of software. And then if you think about open source, you have to think about um, yeah, basically trying to convince each and every of those subsidiaries to maybe standardize on certain projects, on certain open source projects. And in order to do that, you even have to know that they like that the companies exist and that they use certain things. Uh, with Anne yesterday and Boris, I discussed that we, like even within one of our energy providers, we use different uh, forecasting models. And like I asked them why they do this, and they didn't have an answer for me. Um, and like this is just one of our like 50 energy providers that we have in Europe, and like a single one is using different forecasting models with different kind of data. And like the company just 
yeah, hurts itself by doing this. Um, yeah, and that's the challenge for me to change that. <laughs> that's but also a great opportunity. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. like there, there's huge opportunity to change this, yeah. and this will like help Eon as a company. This will help the open source community uh, eventually, hopefully. But yeah, yeah. it's, it's going to be a challenge. <laughs> Uh, each of you, can you share your advice for the audience who is planning to invest in uh, open source management and readiness or to grow its presence uh, across the organization? Boris? Um, one of the key takeaways you should take is uh, if, you, if you want to build an OSPO, do it. And by that I mean build a Teams, uh, I don't know, wh whatever tool you use. Uh, for a community management inside your company, but inside this, this, this tool, build the community first and say, okay, I am the guy, even, you are, if, even if your boss didn't ask it, hack the, hack the company. Do, do the community and say, okay, I'm the guy who is interesting, maybe the first one, but you will find a lot of friends jumping in this community. So the first thing to do is do the community, speak about open source, try to be the focal point of open source in your company, and it will bootstrap what will become an OSPO and what will become an open source journey in your company. Uh, so this is, I think, the, the, the most important advice. Create an email, create a web page, an internal web page, trying to speak about what we spoke about uh, concerning the connection with the security, the compliance uh, risk we are at when we are doing open source. Try to figure what can be uh, the interest of doing open source inside your company through this community and it will grow up. Sebastian, wha what is your advice? Yeah, like Boris said, like, um, yeah, shake up your company internally, basically. That's a good start. And then, like, another good start is to just start small. As I said, like, a company, like, especially like Eon, it can be huge and overwhelming to even find a starting point. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of people that once you start talking about this, that want to help you, and they, they will be there. Um, so s start with like easily achievable um, objects that you that you know that you have help for. Um, and like the first thing I did was the open source policy, um, and like I. Like literally, like within the first week, I start, started to talk to the legal department, and again they said, "Yes, finally someone is here that takes care of this." And then I started to talk with the lawyers of Ian, um, and you can do this with basically every other part, be it contributions, be it transformation, ripping out parts of the software, replacing it with open source. Start somewhere small while you have help, and then grow from there. Yeah, we, we have to hurry up a little bit. <laughs> okay. I will take it uh, shortly. Yeah, what is your advice? Yeah. So my advice is uh, take benefit of the learnings out there. Eh? I think you being here, uh, joining this, uh, joining, uh, this panel, uh, take benefit of all that knowledge that's out there from other organizations, from peer organizations, and reuse that in your organization. Uh, I really advise uh, yeah. to take, uh, take benefit of that. Yes, you told me that there is some trainings provided by the Linux Foundation Energy. Yeah. And yes, so what you are saying is that we have to use it. And you also told me that collaboration is key. How do you collaborate between OSPOs? I think uh, as important it is for, for open source projects to collaborate, it is also for OSPOs to collaborate. Uh, as already mentioned, uh, the, the teams in our, each of our organizations is not big. Uh, but we still can make a huge impact. And one of the ways we can make that impact is also to collaborate on an OSPO level. Now, I speak to Boris uh, quite often and we exchange challenges uh, regarding open source pra best practices, open source policies, and see how we can take learnings of that and uh, maybe even adopt one another's practices. Uh, but we're also involved in the two group, which is a more uh, foundation around OSPOS, which has great materials, and see how we can leverage that. And that's uh, really taking that open source spirit uh, also in our daily work of, of our OSPOS is, I think, is key uh, to make it successful. Boris, can you give the audience an, a concrete tip for, uh, to get started? Contact us. <laughs> If ah. I need to be quick, I think it's 
It's exactly what Jonas said. Uh, for example, we met the first time, Sebastian and I, yesterday, around the beer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and I discovered that he had to do the work for all this uh, compliance work he has to do. Jonas already did that. I did that. Some pieces are secret. We can't share with Sebastian. But when you are in the LF Energy ecosystem, it's very easy to come to someone who already did what you will have to do. So feel free to contact. Hydro-Quebec is just here. We had very great exchange when they jumped in the LF Energy. Um, and, 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 and maybe you are already in, or you will jump in the LF Energy. Feel free to contact us. That's my advice. And to finish, uh, Sebastian, can you give us a concrete tip? Well, yeah, as I said before, like start small and reach out. Like not just within LF Energy, there might be an OSPO in a completely separate industry, but they still need to tackle the same kind of basic problems that we do, like license compliance um, or even tech stuff or how to talk to your lawyer. Because <laughs> like most of us are well, computer scientists, IT people, and we're not used to talk to lawyers or upper management, um, and other people already did this. Get help by them. Get help by us. Ask us if you have questions. Come to us. We're basically always open to collaborate. We have nine minutes for questions. Luma. Luma. Can, can you present yourself, please? <laughs> I don't. Wait, wait. We have a mic. Oh, we have a microphone. It's not working. It's enough. Maybe we have a mic. No? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Luma Zamarreño from Grupo Aya. We are contributors to a possible project, one of the project that uh, is uh, pushed by, uh, have been, has been pushed by RT. Uh, my question is, uh, you are uh, from the uh, utilities. You, you, you have uh, created an, an, an OSPO uh, in the side of the utility. Have you uh, uh, contacted or experienced exchanges with vendors? Are, are vendors also uh, moving to that uh, field, or, uh, how do you manage relationships or potential relationships? Uh, Jonas already talked a little bit about exchanging information, but you all come from the same field, same, same view, the, the utility companies. I, I want to maybe gather a, a hint or, or two about uh, potential vendors that are interested in this, in this field or yeah. could, could, could start that. I think that's a great question. So. Uh, uh at the end, we also take a lot of learnings from, from other OSPOs, uh, not only uh, across the uh, utility sector, but uh, especially we learn a lot from, from the technology sectors like uh, Google, Microsoft, which has been on this open source journey way longer before us and has a great experience, but also from other vertical industries. Uh, um, I uh, was at the beginning this year, I uh, joined uh, FOSS Best Stage in Berlin, where I had this great panel discussion with uh, Wolfgang from Mercedes, uh, Cornelis from Deutsche Bahn, uh, and also a coffee discussion afterwards, really be sharing, sharing knowledge uh, and how to do open source management and readiness in, in the different sectors. And I see also more and more uh, vendors uh, uh, starting also uh, an OSPO. Uh, the big vendors and the big, uh, the big, big names already have an OSPO. Sometimes they focus mostly on the legal compliance, but more and more also the OSPO is, is, are going to focus also on the collaboration side. And I think it is also, uh, my experience with those OSPOs is uh, they are really help, happy to, to, to reach to be approached and share the knowledge. So I think the invitation we did from, from, from our side to reach out to us, I would also reach out to those, uh, to those OSPOs uh, which are in similar to your organization uh, and also those vendor OSPOs to learn from their experiences and how they approached uh, open source in their organizations which may be diff different from, from uh, open source in, in, in our case. Uh, and just to add, like. If you don't know if they have an OSPOR or something like this, 
you can still make the license compliance thing part of the contracts or even contract negotiations and then just shake up your vendor a little bit and once they hear that you care about open source license compliance and that you may choose someone else that is able to comply, they start to get really, really busy and then come out with lawyers so that actually know what they're talking about and then they suddenly they have uh, open source software developers appear in the contract negotiations actually talking to you and explaining what they do and this can really help like because most of the time contract negotiations are done with like in between your procurement and upper management of your vendor and all the stuff that we talk about is actually not part of those conversations but you can make it part of those conversations that your vendor then comes to you. And that's really important and helpful. Yeah. We are going to take another question. Yes, uh, Tim Montag from Accenture. Um, I have a question. Uh, so if we look at projects that are being done also with open source software, especially in the utility sector, uh, some best practice that we have across all projects nowadays is a PMO, yeah? a project management office. We don't so much see an open source program office or something involved in those projects uh, a lot. Yeah, It's maybe one question related to, hey, can we use this license? But does it make sense from your side uh, to include this also in the standard project setup, the open source component of the OSPO, for example, as a standard role in such a project like we do with PMOs nowadays? And uh, do you have experience in that yet? Uh, how did you, let's say, uh, um, yeah, put it into a common structure for your uh, companies, for example? I would say it, it really depends on the project and the needs. Yeah? So if it's a really big project and uh, which open source plays a very crucial role in it, it helps to build up that expertise part of that project. Uh, and, and I think it, that doesn't mean that every project does need to have an OSPO uh, as well, but it helps to have that knowledge in there. And also, and your company-wide OSPO can also help bring that knowledge to that project. So for some smaller projects, it's, it's sufficient that uh, the OSPO can be there as uh, backup for all questions or uh, need, to, need to ask questions uh, and provide also the best practice which the project team can, can adopt themselves. So I would say it, uh, in, in projects where open source is crucial and open source collaboration is crucial, it helps to have that capacity in part of that project. Is it necess necessary? I would say uh, not always, it really depends. Yeah, maybe it, it, I can it, add something because um, Boris is my open source director and I was, uh, I am I, indeed, um, leading the possible project inside ERT. What is really important to me is that Boris take his phone and call me each week. And if he <laughs> does not do that, I'm upset because I, I need him to motivate me and my team each week and to to exchange about best practices, to exchange about the issue, to exchange about how to manage a community, and I think it, it works. You don't need someone. Tran transversal management is enough, but you have to put a good person <laughs> as a PMO. Yeah, thank you for your answers. So. It's good to have somebody ready, but it's, from your perspective, if I understood you're correct, not that much necessary to include it in any project. It depends a little bit on the size of the project. Uh, and if I may, uh, half question. Um, what do you think about, let's say, strategic decisions? You want to build a new tool, you want to uh, introduce maybe some new software. Do you always, maybe just from your experiences at E.ON uh, RTE, um, and Alianda, do you uh, have somebody from the OSPO involved in that decision or do you consider open source for any software decision or not? Well, I can start, like, before I started at E.ON, none of those questions were asked, like, generally. And this, like, the decision made on those questions depended on the actual service or product manager. And some of them chose to just go with a vendor and then put money where their mouth is and not care about it. Some other project actually thought about this, built a product around open source dependencies, looked into what dependencies they want to use and stuff like this, and then they, they even thought about yeah, the governance of the projects that it may they use and not. 
but that's just like using existing stuff. The other thing is um, like the decision of open sourcing your internal stuff. Like you both did, and I'd love to have your opinion on that. But yeah, like in that case, is the OSPO should be involved because like generally the OSPO is the most knowledgeable place in the company to well, yes, steer that kind of decision, at least from my point of view. You can't let that decision be made by any kind of management. Hmm. Uh, do I have 30 seconds? OK. Oh. Tim, um, I think we are speaking about here the readiness level of your open source program office. Uh, we are also questioning the maturity level. I think what you mentioned is a very mature uh, structure of open source in a company or in an academy, et cetera. Um, what I would advise is to brief and to have uh, good connections with the enterprise architect. Because these guys are already connected to the project, whatever the side we are considering. But uh, if they are uh, interested by inner source, so bringing common software inside the subsidiaries, inside the same company, and to try to have common piece of software, common connections of data, etc. Uh, you will bring them to open source through this, through this way. That's what I am trying to do. So I think inner source is the first step for these steps. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, the three of you, for joining today. Thank you, Anne. And, uh, and thank you all. Bye, and see there. you if you have some question around. Thank you.